So we'll go ahead and get started. So our first presenter is Mateo Garcia Olazabal. He is a graduate student in biology at Texas A&M. And today he's going to be talking about potential causes of melanoma. So uh, Mateo, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, Mike, for the introduction. Can you see my screen? Yes, yep. Okay. So as Michael said, I'm, I am a PhD student in Dr. Rosenthal's lab and I work closely with Dr. Manfred Shuttle as well. And today I'm going to be talking to you about how anthropogenic disturbance can indirectly cause melanoma in natural cyphophorus hybrids. So I'm going to just jump straight into the system. We have a really cool system that we study. We have, sorry, there we go. We have two species that occur along an altitudinal gradient. We have the lowland species that is called cyphophorus birchmani that occurs at, at low heights, low elevations. And we have the highland species that is called cyphophorus malinche that occurs at highlands. The classical characteristic of this species is that it has this extension in the skull of fin that is called a sword and therefore these fish are called swordtails. And the characteristic of the downstream population would be that they have a big dorsal fin, a hump in the head, and some individuals can have this spot in the tail. What's interesting about this system is that we have at intermediate heights, we have viable hybrids that had been uh, hybridizing for at least 30 generations, probably more. And what also happens at these intermediate height uh, altitudes is that most of the human activity is focused here. And therefore, water quality in these intermediate altitudes is, is, is less. They have, there's a lot of humic acid that it's a chemical component that it's known to affect uh, made choice in, 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 in this fish. And so my advisor did some sexual preference tests in one of our parental species. And, and he determined that when we test female preference in different kinds of water, so spring water and tap water, in black, we see the preference for conspecifics. Birchmanite females here in black prefer the conspecific, but when we test them in the Rio Galnari water, we see that this preference is shifted towards heterospecifics. So in, in Rio Galnari water, that is presumably of less quality, the, 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 this preference is shifted and therefore this anthropogenic chemical disturbance of the, of the environment can indeed facilitate hybridization. If one of the parental species prefers to mate with the other parental species, this is going to facilitate hybridization. And then, and so when hybridization occurs, what we're going to have is a combination of the phenotypes of both parental species. So you see, you can see that the hybrids can have the big dorsal fin with the sword and the spot and all the, all the possible combinations of the parental phenotypes. What I'm interested in is in a particular phenotype that is called spotted cuddle, that is this spot that the uh, Cyphophorus birchman has in, in its cuddle fin and, some, and the hybrids do as well. And there is uh, some variation, natural variation in the expression of this spotted cuddle phenotype that, that from now on I'm gonna call SC. So some individuals lack this spotted cuddle some of them just have a, a, a spot, a normal spot. This spot can extend and expand to other parts of the body and it can even grow into a 3D configuration into a full malignant melanoma. And this is what I'm actually interested in, in my PhD. That's my main focus in, in, in my PhD is to understand what is triggering this change from benign pigmentation uh, into, into malignant pigmentation. And so, what I, what I um, luckily this is not the first um, time we observed this in, in, in the system in our species. In lab reared cyphophorus hybrids, we've seen that they generate melanoma as well. Um, well. This is the classical cross between the platyfish and the swordtail. Here, what, what we see is that in the platyfish has benign, some benign pigmentation. The swordtail doesn't have any pigmentation at all. The F1 hybrid has this also benign pigmentation, but when we back cross the F1 hybrid again with the sword tail, we see that 
one quarter of its offspring generates this really malignant and invasive melanoma. This, this happens because in the platyfish, there is an interaction between two genes that are balancing each other. We have an uh, TU that represents an oncogene gene that is balanced by an R gene that is a, a regulatory gene, a tumor suppressor gene. So when we have an oncogene in presence of a tumor suppressor gene, what we have is a benign pigmentation. But as you see in the back, cro back cross hybrids, sometimes we only get the copy of the oncogene and therefore the malignant uh, melanoma is expressed. And so, this is a typical example of a hybrid incompatibility. And we know that in our system, due to high resolution mapping, that we have hundreds of these genetic incompatibilities in our system. This is previous work done by our, our lab. And the interesting thing about our system and our, about our hybrids is that there are two types of population. We've seen there's two types of population regarding their ancestry distribution. So what I'm showing you here is uh, uh, an histogram of the ancestry of the population. So individuals, this is um, particularly how similar they are to Cyphophorus malinche, one of the parental species. And so individuals that fall on this end of the axis are more malinche-like hybrids and individuals that fall on this end are more Birchmanite-like hybrids. And so we see that some populations can have this structure pattern in which we have two clusters, right? We have uh, the birchmana like hybrids and the Malinche-like hybrids. And this is likely maintained by assortative mating, strong assortative mating, which means that you mate to what's similar to you. So if you're a Malinche-like hybrid, you like to mate with Malinche-like hybrids and the same case for birchmana like hybrids. However, there are other populations that lack this population structure. They're unstructured. And this is due because the individuals, the hybrids there mate randomly. I'm not showing you here the data, but if you look at SC, because I'm going to show it to you later, the SC frequency in these kind of populations is slow, it's similar to the parental, uh, to, the, to the frequencies observed in Cyphophorus spirituani, the parental species that has SC. And in, in these populations, however, in the unstructured populations, the, the SC frequency is way higher and the malignancy is higher as well. And so, a previous study in a lab, what, what, thought, um, what thought of doing is to explore what is the relationship between ancestry and SC uh, frequency and malignancy. And so what, what, what happened is we brought back some individuals from each cluster. This is what they look like. This is the ancestry when they were brought from the field. And after some generations in the lab in which we forced them to reproduce with each other, we disrupted this assortative mating in the lab we have the, the offspring to, to have a more random distribution of the ancestry. We see, we observe that the close clarin mates, they generate increased SC frequency and increased phenotypes of SC. And so what I haven't told you is that these, these populations, the, the structured populations and the unstructured population, this population occurs upstream the Calnali urban area. Calnali is the city in Mexico where we have a research station. And this population occurs downstream the Canali urban area. Why is this important? This is important because I, I went and looked what happens between the populations, between the upstream population and the downstream population. I looked to what happened in, in, in those populations that we found between them. So I'm showing you here a map of the area. Here's the upstream population and here's the downstream population. So I looked at the SC frequency for each one of these populations. And what we see is that as we approach the downstream site, the SC frequency increases. And it not only in increases its frequency, it also increases its level of malignancy. So here we, we have a, a graph that shows us the, the average SC area for the downstream population and for the upstream population. And so we see that the downstream population has higher areas, bigger areas of SC, which means that SC is not only more frequent, but also more malignant. And this correlation between, this correlation of the increase of SC is correlated again with ancestry. So we look at the upstream populations, we see these structure cluster populations. And 
when we look at the at ancestry patterns of downstream populations, this structure is broken down. Okay, so provided what we know about our system and about what is going on in the example with the platyfish and the swordtail hybrids, what we think is going on is that there is an epistatic interaction causing melanoma. So when the hybrids hybridize, there is an interaction between some genes of Malinche and Birchmanite that triggers this phenotype, that, that triggers a change from benign pigmentation to malignant melanoma. And so the question is now why, why structured populations become unstructured populations? So why do we go from assorative mating to random mating? The, the answer to this question is we don't know yet, but we have a really interesting hypothesis. And for this, we have to remember how the hybrids were created on the first place. And we, if we remember the chemical disturbance of the water generates hybridization. And, and if we look, we see that the downstream populations are within or downstream the Kalnali city, the Kalnali area. So we haven't tested this, this yet, but the water quality down downstream the urban area is 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 it's visually and and you can you can you know we know it's it's worse than upstream, and so this is a good hypothesis. So hybridization. Is, is causing a melanoma the, uh, in the downstream populations. And so what's really interesting about this system is that we can use this system in order to, to find which one are the oncogene and which one are the tumor suppressor genes. So the oncogene, it's, it's known from the literature and it's, and it's, um, it's a, it's a well-known gene that's called Xmark. And we did a, a population study in a pure Birchmanite population and we recovered this gene, we also found a signal for this gene when we did a present absence of SC study, and and we found that X mark is present in the in Cephalus mitchmani, which makes sense because it has the spot, right? And then we also did a um, a mixture mapping in a hybrid population to find to try to find to try to identify which one is the the tumor suppressor gene, the gene that is interacting with the oncogene in order to produce the phenotype. And so now the main part of my research is to to evaluate the function of agri5 I, I am generating transgenic lines and we already know it's overexpressed in melanoma tissue and and this is this is the main the main focus of my research now but in some what i told you is that anthropogenic disturbance can can promote hybridization hybridization in turn promotes melanoma and and this is a really 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 interesting system to study and identify novel genes involved with melanoma and with that i would like to help all all the supporting agents and of course um, the organizers of this symposium that they are able to carry it, to carry it given the difficult conditions so thank you so much for organizing and if you have any questions i'll i'll, I'll be happy to answer them Great, thanks, Mateo. That was that was really cool. Um, so thank you. Uh, so at this point, anyone can ask questions if you'd like. Uh, you can use the chat option. Uh, you can find the chat if you kind of scroll your mouse in the bottom of the screen. There should be a, a little chat button you can click. Um, or feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself and and ask the question directly. So we have one question in the chat. Did you? Uh, sample above cow mid, where does the structure appear in the canal stream? So yeah, we sampled above cow, uh, cow mid and for, for the sake of the present day, I didn't show, but it has similar frequencies and similar patterns as in cow mid. Um, where does the structure appear in the canal stream? So we know when, when, it, when, it's, when it's broken, it's broken down in the, in the basically in the first population that it's within the urban area. Great. Uh, you have some some positive feedback from Martin. Uh, you're amazing. Very clear. <laughs> uh, any other questions for Mateo? A lot of good feedback in the chat. That's good. 
Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, uh, we'll go ahead and, and move on to the next speaker. Uh, Mateo, again, thank you very much. That was really thank great. Thank you so much for organizing. Yeah, great. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Connor Adams. So Connor, uh, did, is Connor here? Yeah, great, okay, cool. So Connor, uh, if you're comfortable, you can go ahead and, and turn your video on and share your screen. So Connor is a graduate student at um, Stephen F. Austin. And today he's going to be talking about uh, trophic and community structures. So Connor, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, just a second. Sure. All right, can everybody see that? Yep. Good to go? Yep. All right, so um, thank you for the introduction. My name is uh, Connor Adams. I'm a second year graduate student at Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches, Texas. And uh, today I'll hey, be talking, uh, yeah. Sorry, Connor, I don't mean to start you, to cut you off right in the beginning. Uh, your presentation isn't in full screen. Uh, I don't know. If oh, I'm sorry, I thought I did that. You're fine. Uh, just a second. Yeah, no, no problem. Oh, this is in the way, hang on. Good? Yep, perfect. All right, sorry about that. No problem. Anyways, uh, my name's Connor. I'm a second year graduate student at Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches, Texas. Uh, today, I wanted to talk about some of the work I've been doing for my master's thesis. Uh, so we'll just get right into it. Um, so typically when we think about the impacts of human activities on ecological systems, it's usually in a negative sense. Um, but many of the world's ecosystems are so highly degraded that natural recovery processes are not enough to ensure ecosystem recovery. And the future of these degraded ecosystems will ultimately depend on the ability to apply these frameworks that incorporate both structural and functional approaches to restoration ecology. And a great example of a system that is becoming increasingly degraded is the now endangered shortleaf pine ecosystem. Um, and as you can see from this inventory map in which the uh, black, there we go, in which the black line indicates the historic range of the species, uh, shortleaf forests have experienced substantial declines uh, attributed to changes in land use such as commercial silviculture and regeneration harvest. Um, Fortunately, there are these renewed efforts to restore these unique ecosystems using uh, forest management practices like prescribed fire and regeneration harvest. Uh, however, little is known about how these restoration efforts affect energy flow and food web structure. Restoration ecology has historically been based on a uh, succession driven bottom up view and is not generally incorporated, uh, incorporated uh, food web perspectives. And uh, food webs represent a way of envisioning ecological systems that considers trophic interactions among guilds or trophic levels. And so what we wanted to know is how does energy flow differ between uh, these undermanaged sites versus uh, these undermanaged sites right here versus uh, these sites that are being restored or actively restored to mimic historic conditions. Um, and also, what do the food webs look like considering the potential uh, for management to shift uh, basal resources that ground these food webs or that ultimately ground these food webs? So in other words, uh, how might this forest management uh, or how might these forest management practices function as this top down control that drives bottom up processes that support higher consumers? Uh, it's not switching on me. There we go. Um, and to explore these questions, uh, we use snake consumers as a model. Uh, snakes are excellent models for understanding trophic interactions within and among prey and predators, uh, not only because they are obligate predators, but they also exhibit a wide range of dietary preferences. So our primary objective for this talk was to examine and compare the trophic structure of snake communities between forests under high frequency management 
uh, versus low frequency management regimes. And for our high frequency treatment, we chose a site with a management regime consisting of one to three year fire intervals with prevalent thinning and regeneration harvest. And from this photo, you can see that this forest is very park-like and open with lots of sunlight hitting the ground and a really well-developed herbaceous layer. Um, for the low frequency treatment, we chose this site with fire intervals around eight years with no other management taking place in several decades. And you can see that this has led to a forest structure with an increased mid-story that has essentially closed the canopy and you see a lot of this duff built up on the forest floor. But to be safe and really drive home how forest management can result in these drastic differences in forest structure, we measured habitat variables in each of our treatments. And indeed, uh, we can see from this principal component analysis that our sampling localities in each treatment are clearly separated along this gradient of increased herbaceous cover and open canopy with decreased basal area to decrease open canopy and increase basal area. So they're very, very different sites. Um, to capture snakes for our study, we deployed a total of 20 box traps uh, equipped with drift fences at these sampling localities for two field seasons in 2018 and 2019. And once we captured snakes, we took scale clippings from each individual. We also collected dominant basal resources and potential prey items in each treatment. Um, then we homogenized these samples and sent them off for stable isotope analysis to obtain isotope ratios for carbon and nitrogen that could be used to make inferences on food web structure. And so if we look at the basic structure of our snake communities, uh, what we observed was greater species diversity in the high frequency treatment with 17 species in the high frequency compared to 12 species in the low frequency treatment. And we can also see some very pattern, varied patterns of uh, abundance between, uh, between, uh, tree, uh, between species. Um, for example, we observed that the majority of captures in the low frequency treatment um, were dominated by uh, the three most abundant species, which are copperheads, ribbon snakes, and rat snakes. And if we look at the slopes of both of our rank abundance curves together, we can see how our low frequency site typically at, or seems to have much lower evenness in terms of species abundance. Um, incorporating the isotopic data uh, allows us to examine these aspects of food web structure and isotopic space uh, uh, where the nitrogen values uh, exhibit stepwise enrichment with each trophic transfer and can be used to estimate the relative trophic position of a species. However, carbon ratios uh, vary among primary producers with different photosynthetic pathways, such as C3 versus C4 plants, changing little with each trophic transfer, allowing us to determine the ultimate sources of dietary carbon within species. Um, furthermore, we can apply uh, these community-wide metrics based on the mean values of species to quantify trophic diversity and trophic redundancy in each snake community and make comparisons across our high frequency and low frequency treatments. And if you look at this isotopic biplot of the snake communities in both of our treatments, we can see that our snake community in the low frequency treatment had a larger degree of trophic diversity based on the calculation of uh, the standard error ellipses. And this trophic diversity was reflected in both of the ranges of carbon and nitrogen. However, in the high frequency treatment, we found that species were much more tightly packed in uh, isotopic space, uh, according to calculations of mean nearest neighbor distance and centroid distance, and exhibit a pattern of this increased trophic redundancy. <clears throat> so, in conclusion, the results of our study suggest that restoration practices or the lack thereof can have a substantial impact on the trophic structure of snake communities within these shortleaf pine forests. And uh, this differential application of practices like prescribed fire might be functioning as uh, environmental filters that can not only affect forest structure, 
but may also affect the heterogeneity of resources that ultimately support snake consumers. Uh, in fact, isotopic baselines in the high frequency treatment featured the addition of the C4 photosynthetic pathway that was not found in our low frequency treatment, despite the presence of a narrow carbon range in the snake community. Um, and furthermore, we observed higher species diversity and greater trophic redundancy in, this, in, in our high frequency treatment, which suggests that these species are likely not resource limited and the snake community as a whole may be more resilient. Um, and finally, uh, you know, applying these food web approaches can provide a dynamic interaction driven view of ecosystems that may be able to benefit future restoration of degraded ecosystems, especially in pine forests of the southeastern United States. And one way to do this is to help identify the trophic interactions that might have some bearing on restoration outcomes. Uh, and as I continue um, my thesis research, uh, we'll be working on using mixing models to actually look at the relative contribution of some of the prey we collected to our snakes to get a more clear picture of what's going on here. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank the US Forest Service, specifically the Southern Research Station, uh, the USDA McIntyre Stennis uh, for funding, the TLL Tipple Foundation, specifically Steve Jack, Robert Sanders, and Dr. Wynn Rosser uh, for access to their beautiful property. And also I'd like to thank uh, all my fellow colleagues in the shock lab uh, for all their advice and uh, criticism. And with that, I'll take any questions. Cool, well, thanks Connor, that was, that was really cool. Um, so at this point, anyone can ask on our questions um, in the chat or unmute yourself. Feel free to just ask away. Um, there's always this awkward moment when we wait yeah. for people to type. Um, I guess uh, in the meantime, I, I can ask a, a couple pretty dumb questions, I think. Um, can you, so I may have missed it, but can you just go ahead and, and tell me the difference again between the high frequency and the low frequency treatments? What was the difference between those the, the difference in as far as the uh, the basal resources or the forest structure in general, or just the difference of the results in the snake community? Structure? The difference in their structure, yeah. Sure, sure, no problem. So, if you just give me one second here, let me go back. Okay, so in our low frequency site, we, we observed this uh, increased kind of trophic diversity, right? Um, but in our high frequency, or we, reserve, or we saw this redundancy, right? This trophic redundancy. So basically all of these snakes or all these different species that make up the snake community and the high frequency community are all doing the same thing. They're kind of all, they kind of all have the same trophic role, if you will. So the idea behind that is that the loss of any one of these species uh, could be made up for by other species since they're all kind of doing the same things. Uh, I see, okay, cool. Any other um, questions? In, your, in the chat, uh, your advisor says you did a great job. Oh, great, <laughs> that's good news. So good, good feedback. I'll take it, all right. Any, if there are no other questions for Connor, uh, we'll go ahead and move on. So again, thanks, Connor. All right, thank you all so much. Thanks for listening. Yeah. So we have our next scheduled talk uh, is scheduled for 310. So uh, I guess, unfortunately, things are running too smoothly. Um, we're a bit ahead of schedule. So in the meantime, I guess I'll, I'll do a, a quick plug. Um, so after this, I mean, this is the last session, but at 430, you can come back. Um, if you go on our website and click on the link for the, the closing remarks and award ceremony, uh, at that point, we will be giving out awards for uh, best talk in for each of the sessions. Um, so certainly if you're a speaker and, and even if even if you're not, it would, it's, it's going to be a, a fun little session. Um, so again, you can come to our website and click on the link for that. That's going to happen at um, at 430. Okay, so uh, so next up, we'll, we'll just keep moving along, is uh, Stephen Bovio. So Stephen is a, a graduate student in biology at Texas A&M, and uh, today he's going to be talking about sword tails. So Stephen, I guess actually, Connor, if you could stop your sharing. Um, cool, thank you. Uh, and then Stephen... 
you're here. Yeah, you're here. Um, feel free to hop on and share your screen. Okay. All right, can everyone see that? Yes, yep. All right. OK, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, today, I'll be discussing my efforts in this exploring local adaptation in a population of hybridizing swordtails. These are freshwater, um, freshwater fish that are endemic to Mexico. But before I go into the details about our study system, I want to give you an idea of why hybridization is an important biological process that can help us to understand how new species form and how they evolve and adapt to their local environments. So consider an ancestral lineage that becomes separated. Perhaps over time, the river splits and individuals on either side of the river um, gets uh, gene flow between individuals on either side gets severed. And over time, each population is going to evolve independent mutations and evolve to their local environments. So these can be morphological traits like I've depicted in this cartoon. Uh, they can also be behavioral or physiological, all of which can potentially contribute to reproductive isolation. But what happens when these barriers to reproduction break down or reproductive isolation is incomplete, which seems to be the rule rather than, than the exception? Um, interesting things can happen. So assuming speciation is not complete and they come into secondary contact uh, and are capable of producing fertile hybrid offspring, then all of a sudden an entire new source of genetic and phenotypic variation becomes available. Now, although these events may be rare, they offer the genetic variation needed that may not arise um, through mutation alone. So these are the two fish species we study, Xiphophorus birchmanii and Malinche. Uh, birchmanii are found uh, in the lowlands in warmer waters, and Malinche are found in the highlands at cooler waters. They're about half a million years diverged. And they're also diverged at several morphological, behavioral, and physiological traits. One of the most pronounced being the um, this sword trait, uh, the extension of their caudal fin, which has been secondarily lost in the Birchmanite population as a result of female preference. And in the wild, we see uh, they form these natural, natural hybrid zones. And you can see the degree of variation in these hybrid phenotypes from different populations. And they form uh, these hybrid zones are replicated throughout several independent water drainages. So you can see one water drainage down here and another just a few kilometers away on the other side of the mountain. And we've, uh, of course, these fish can migrate between um, different areas of the river. Migration is going to be biased downstream. It's easier to go downstream than upstream. And we've studied a few of these drainages quite extensively over, um, over the past, well, quite about 15 years. We have accumulated a 15 year whole genome data set from different populations along, this, along these rivers. In addition, we've explored a interesting trait that we think may be under selection in these populations. It's thermal tolerance. And uh, this refers to uh, the minimum or the maximum water temperature at which, at which these fish can maintain equilibrium. So we've designed these sophisticated assays where we subject a fish to a pot of water and steadily increase or decrease the water temperature until the fish loses equilibrium. At that point, we'll immediately remove them from the, from the pot, place them in a recovery tank, and within a few minutes, they're swimming back to normal. Um, it's not a pleasant experiment to conduct as it's surely stressful on the fish, but none of them die in this process and, and they all recover. Uh, but what we find from this, from this data is a beautiful signal where 
Uh, pure Bergeronite populations collected at low elevations can maintain thermal equilibrium at uh, greater water temperatures than populations at higher elevations. Uh, we see that hybrid, uh, hybrid populations collected along the, along the river, they perform intermediately while the pure Bergeronite populations uh, exhibit the lowest thermal tolerance. But one thing that we don't know is it's unclear exactly which regions of the genome contribute to these differences between the species. And so the main objective of my project is to identify the genomic regions associated with thermal tolerance and track how the allele frequencies change over time in these regions um, in these different natural, natural hybrid populations. So what we predict is that when hybridization first occurred, that these populations are going to be 50% Birchmanai, 50% Malinche. And that over time, recombination begins to break up the genome and shuffle it up. And if Birchmanai alleles are adapted to warmer waters and Malinche alleles are adapted to cooler waters, then we predict uh, hybrid populations occupying warmer waters to have an increase in frequency of burst penile alleles at that locus and vice versa for hybrid populations occupying cooler waters. Meanwhile, if water temperatures begin to increase over time, we can track and see if that correlates with an increase in frequency of the burst penile allele in the hybrid populations occupying warming waters. So this is a photo of one of the natural sites that we study. It sits directly behind our field station in Calnali. Uh, it's in the state of Hidalgo, Mexico. And we don't only leverage the natural sites, but we've built these 2000 liter mesocosm stock tanks that uh, we can make controlled laboratory crosses in. And so to identify the thermal tolerance locus, we made early generation intercross hybrids in these tanks and are going to perform a QTL analysis. If you're unfamiliar with a QTL analysis, uh, this involves generating backcross or intercrossed hybrids, measuring some phenotype, uh, sequencing their genomes so that we can make statistical associations between their genotypes and their phenotypes. And uh, in January, I conducted these trials, these thermal tolerance trials on 195 hybrids. And this is what the variation in that trait looks like. The next step is to use a sequencing and bioinformatic technique, which allows us to detect which regions of the genome are inherited from either of the parental species. So in the end, what we get is these pretty plots where uh, regions that are homozygous for Malinche are in blue, and regions that are homozygous for Birchmanai are in red. So you find in both of the parental populations, they're going to be blue at every locus and red at every locus. They're homozygous at every locus. But that in these hybrid populations, um, we often find that they're skewed towards one of the hybrid, um, one of the parental species. So in this case, we find a Malinche skewed hybrid, and this would be an example of a Birchmanai skewed hybrid. So we're currently at step six for this project. Um, our lab, our, we have our, um, uh, we've sent all of our, our samples off to the sequencer, and we should be getting the data back soon. And while we're waiting for that, I'll show you data on how allele frequencies at uh, some a priori targets of selection are changing over time in two hybrid populations. So now I'll be leveraging that whole, that 14 year whole genome data set I was talking about before. So to orient you to this graph, you have time on the X axis and Malinche allele frequency on the Y axis. So one is gonna be 100% Malinche, zero is um, all Birchmanai. And if we look at the red, the red is showing the genome wide average uh, for these two hybrid populations. So this uh, one at the top is a highland population and this one at the bottom is a lowland population. 
And um, what we can do from here is plot how individual loci are changing over time with respect to the genome-wide average and uh, test for deviations from a null expectation. And so that's exactly what's plotted in black. And in this case, it's a histone demethylase that's involved in gene regulation and may be under strong temperature dependent selection. Um, and so what were the types of deviations we're looking for, if we're looking at just this highland population, um, we're looking for allele frequencies to be overrepresented um, for Malinche, so a greater, um, for this black line to be closer to one, um, or for the rate of increase to be greater than the genome-wide average, suggesting that that allele is evolving faster um, than the genetic background. And so um, in this, for this particular locus, it doesn't appear to, in either population, the frequency of alleles isn't overrepresented towards either of the parental populations, but there is a slight um, increase in the rate of change. Uh, this next graph, instead of showing you a trend line like I did just before for a single locus, this figure on the left is showing you the distribution of allele frequencies for 66 heat shock protein loci. Um, so we also have evidence to think that uh, these, these loci may be under selection with respect to, um, to the elevational gradient or the water temperature in this system. So um, you can see that in both the highland and in the lowland population that some of these loci have allele frequencies that are shifted far outside the genome-wide average. Um, and to th this particular figure, you're unable to see how a given locus is evolving through time. So if we look at the figure on the right, this is plotting the value of the slopes for all, for all of those loci. So another way to interpret this is that the, um, the low side down here that have negative slopes, that means they're, they're evolving more towards the Birchman I like ancestry. If you're at the top half of this graph, you're evolving um, to become more uh, Malinche like. And what we see is that at least from these low side, there's not a strong deviation from the null expectation. So um, moving forward, what we're we need to conduct the QTL analysis with the, um, from the intercross hybrids that we uh, perform those thermal tolerance trials on and track how, if, if we find any hits for, for that, track how those allele frequencies are changing at this region and see if they're matching what we predict, predict is happening or if they match some of these other data sets. We can also look at how, um, the allele frequency changes um, at, or not how the allele frequency changes, but we can just look at the allele frequencies along an elevational climb. So this isn't a time, time series data set, but instead it's a data set that has um, greater resolution, if you will. We've sampled at more, um, at more spots along the river, and we have uh, two, two data sets for this that we can look at. So with that, I would like to thank my lab, um, the CCHAS community, uh, where we perform our uh, field research in Mexico, NSF for funding, and the, uh, my doctoral program, EEB, and of course, for the members for organizing this conference. So I'll take any questions now. Cool, thanks, Stephen. That's really, uh, really cool work. So at this point, anyone can can ask a question either in the chat or or uh, by unmuting yourself. Um, we have we have plenty of time. As we um, wait for questions. Um, this is this is not my field, so I'm I'm a bit naive here. Uh, when the the video, I, 
was really cool when the the fish lost equilibrium and it, it just kind of went crazy. So what, what does it mean to, for a fish to lose equilibrium? It's just, um, so until that point, they're swimming around pretty normally. You can tell they're breathing heavily and it's certainly uncomfortable, but it's basically just a point where they can no longer control their, their, their swimming equilibrium and um, they kind of just go into a state of um, almost like torpors or something where mm, they're, they're kind of just stunned, they're immobilized for a little bit. And if you, if you would continue to increase their decrease the temperature, you would kill the, you would kill the, the fish for sure. Wow. I mean, they, can, they can only take so, they can only take so much. And if you probably even left them, we, we've never left them at that temperature, the, the temperature at which they lose equilibrium. We've never left them at that temperature that long. But I imagine if you did that, they would, and you just stopped increasing the temperature, they would probably um, not, not survive for very long. Mm. Yeah, they're very, they're very sensitive to the um, water temperature. And even in the lab, when we're keeping them in the lab, it's um, a challenge to keep all of that right, especially because the two species kind of have different optimal preferences for that. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a very interesting design. It's cool. Right. I can't see the chat box for whatever reason. Um, so if people are asking me questions there, I won't know. Sure. Yeah, no, I'll let you know. So far, uh, we don't have any questions there yet. Okay, but that's no problem. Hopefully we can get a couple here. Um, uh, we have one question. Why was the... We have two questions now. Okay, so the first is, why was the coffee cup in the pot? There is a, um, a digital thermometer under there that um, is recording the temperature. Also, it, it provides some structure for the fish. They don't like to, they don't like to be, they like to hide. And so they'll kind of go under like the, the, the holder of the mug. So, yeah. Interesting. Uh, and we have one more question. Uh, which do you think is more strongly selected for cold tolerance or heat tolerance? Um, probably heat, just because we know that there is a there's a genetic basis for it. Um, when we rear the the two parental species in a common environment, we still see this uh, this difference. We don't see the difference for cold tolerance when we rear them under a under a um, common garden. So, I mean, there's two big factors here. There's genetics and then there's environment. Obviously, um, they're both having an effect. So, um, um, you know, if you test, testing the two fish in a common garden is different than if I just took them from their, from their local populations where the water temperature may fluctuate and it's gonna be different throughout, throughout the seasons. Cool. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Well, we'll go ahead and move on to the next speaker. Um, so yeah, just unshare your screen. Yeah. Maybe you can. Cool. Perfect. Uh, okay. So thanks a lot. Uh, our last speaker today, again, we're, we're about 10 minutes ahead of schedule. Um, but our last speaker is uh, Tetela Bokutlo. He is a graduate student in uh, rangeland wildlife and fisheries management. Uh, and I also might add, he's uh, one of the organizing committee members uh, of EIS. Um, and today he's going to be talking about um, uh, habitat in the Okavongo Delta and, and biodiversity there. So TT, whenever you're ready, just uh, go ahead and uh, turn your video on, unmute yourself and uh, share your screen. If you're there. Cool. All right, we can see your screen, but we don't hear you. Hi, Michael. Yep, yep, we can hear you. Perfect. Your video is not turned on. It, it, okay, perfect, awesome. Okay, You're good to go. Uh, 
I think we, we might be seeing the wrong. So if you go up to your display settings in the top, you can switch. Right now we see the go over one on display settings. Yeah. And then just swap that, yeah. Is that? Yep, that's perfect. That's fine now? Yep, we can see just the presentation. Okay, um, my talk today is about um, ephemeral habitat and fish diversity in a subtropical wetland. Um, first of all, I'll start talking about intermittent rivers and aquatic biota in these systems. Intermittent rivers are rivers that experience shifts in between flowing water, standing water, and terrestrial habitat conditions. So there are cycles, periodic cycles of these kind of conditions. And when flows get very low, uh, you usually experience some sort of habitat fragmentation, which results in isolated standing pools of water within the main river channel. Um, these isolated pools will tend to um, produce habitat heterogeneity. Um, and within the same river reach, you may have permanent habitat and ephemeral habitat. Um, usually when flows uh, cease or when they, they, they during the dry period, um, species in these habitats um, have to find ways of emigrating out or else they, they die. So there's local extirpation of species. Um, so species persi persistence in these systems is mainly maintained by periodic recolonization from permanent sources of water. Um, except for those species that have complex life cycles that may enable them to withstand uh, dry periods. These complex Life cycles may include those species that estivate uh, or those species that go that undergo embryonic dipoles and such that when there is re-wetting, they may hatch and colonize the place. Um, flow intermittence may result from several factors. Uh, it may result from natural causes or anthropogenic causes. Natural causes usually are related to climate change and water source, where you may find that um, uh, these habitats depend on the reliability of flows from um, permanent sources or from rainfall. So when there is a less dependable water source, you have increase in flow intermittence. And uh, also channel features may have, uh, may play a role in uh, exacerbating flow intermittence. For instance, when the, there is more bed permeability, you may have uh, increased transmission loss due to bed porosity and maybe a deep water hole, water table. Uh, anthropogenic causes may be such things as alterations of land use, flow regulation, uh, surface and such and such as surface and groundwater extraction for for human exam, for human consumption. Um, there is evidence that uh, flow intermittence is increasing at a global scale, particularly due to climate change and increased water abstraction for, for, human, conduct, for, for human consumption. Uh, despite this evidence, uh, our understanding of the functioning of these systems, uh, particularly due to wetting and drying and the effect of these disturbance dynamics on aquatic biota is less understood, particularly in semi-arid regions of sub-Saharan Africa. 
for this reason, I, 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 I wanted to know um, how flow intermittence affects spatial and temporal characteristic patterns in the lower reaches of the upper Bongo Delta. Um, to, to answer this question, I went out to the Okavango Delta and the Okavango Delta originates uh, in Angola. It originates in Angola. No, the Okavango River originates in Angola and the Okavango River is the one that uh, uh, results in this Okavango Delta. So it originates in Angola and it flows through a small strip here in Namibia before uh, forming a delta in, in the northwestern region of Botswana. Um, therefore, this system is sustained by periodic flooding from the, Angol the Angolan highlands. And therefore, the magnitude and flow depends on the amount of rainfall in the, Angola, in the Angolan highlands. And during particularly high floods, uh, this myriad of channels uh, may form uh, a wetland as big as maybe around 13,000 kilometers squared. And most of the outflow from the wetland into the intermittent rivers occurs through this small channel here, the Boro Channel. And the river uh, terminates in a huge lake called Lake Ngan, and also in the salt pens. And this salt pens is where there is recent research that shows that maybe this could be the cradle of humankind. Um, I went out into uh, the lower reaches of the delta and I sampled four sites in this Bora Channel and the junction between Bora Channel and the Tamalkan River and the junction between the Tamalkan River and the River and also a site in the but they do river. Um, I sampled using a gillnet that has 12 uh, panels, each with a different mesh size, and mesh sizes ranged, ranged from 12 millimeters to as large as 150 millimeters, uh, so that I could capture a wide range of fish diversity and sizes. Um, and then I sampled these sizes, the sites uh, during high water or water. So this is just to show the different types of the different types of habitats in the lower reaches of the Okavango Delta in the sites that I sampled. This upper picture here, the, the, the upper pictures show uh, the sites in the Boro Channel. Uh, these sites tended to, to shrink a lot during the sampling period and some of them experienced complete desiccation and they were classified, I classified them as ephemeral habitats. And then this site in the, in the Boro Tamalakani River Channel uh, retained water throughout the duration of the sampling period and um, I classified them as a permanent habitat. Therefore, after sampling this fish, before I sampled this fish, I had some hypothesis and I was, uh, I hypothesized that um, alpha diversity should be low during the high water season and increase when water level. And also during the low water season, within habitat nestedness should be higher in permanent habitat and species turnover should be higher in ephemeral habitat. And also I expected high species turnover among habitats during low water due to habitat fragmentation. And habitats were expected to homogenize during high water. After collecting the data, I ran some analysis to, to see what was happening. So to account for differences in sample sizes between uh, sites and also for differences in catchability between seasons because during low water, gillnets tend to catch a large amount of fish compared to high water. I used some reflection techniques and boot, bootstrapping. Um, so uh, I bootstrapped uh, each season habitat type combination 
for instance, low water, um, bootstrap it 999 times to obtain uh, the data uh, of species richness. Uh, and after that, I summed the, the, the rows to obtain a single column for species richness. And from this column, I obtained a probability density of species richness. And I did the same for within habitat beta diversity, that is within a single habitat, within a single um, season habitat type, like for instance, uh, during low water in perennial habitat, um, I, I ran the same analysis, uh, but now calculating beta diversity among booster samples within this habitat. And from the, the beta diversity uh, similarity matrix, I generated a probability distribution of beta diversity. And then I did the same for beta diversity across habitats. Uh, for across habitats, like between this habitat, that habitat, or this habitat, and that habitat. And then the, from the dissimilarity matrix, um, I, I ordinated this dissimilarity matrix um, in using an MDS to obtain probability distributions of MDS scores for each season habitat type combination. And then after that, I was interested in seeing whether there is statistical difference in these distributions, which would uh, uh, be able to tell me whether there are differences in species richness within habitat beta diversity plus habitat beta diversity. To do that, um, I just subtracted, first of all, I ranked um, individual booster samples according to mean um, alpha diversity from each distribution, and then I subtracted one, and then I paired this, uh, um, I paired this, this samples, and then I subtracted one distribution from another to obtain a difference of difference, a difference of uh, difference in distribution. And then this was used as a pseudo F value. And then to get a P value, um, we analyzed the, the density of the differences. And if less than 5% of the proportion of the differences uh, encroached beyond zero, that was assumed to be a statistical difference. There was assumed to be a statistical difference among the distribution. A similar analysis was conducted for, for within habitat beta diversity and also for across habitat beta diversity. But of course here using uh, a bivariate kind of analysis because um, we were using MDS1 and MDS2 and the distance between the, the, the MDS score and this line was calculated to estimate the proportion of those differences that encroach beyond this line to estimate the p-value. And then our results show that um, we collected 8,289 8, fishes, which represented 30 species. And we can see clearly that um, the, something was efficient because all of these uh, accumulated species curves are reaching an asymptote. And then we, we found that there was lowest species richness during the high water season. Uh, uh, probably due to migration out of river channel. Species during high water, species migrate out of the river channel to exploit new resources in new habitats that has less competition and predation. And therefore, you may not catch as many species within the river channel. And the, 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 the alpha diversity increase during low water because then the species are are forced to, to go back into the river channel and therefore you, you get um, higher uh, catchability during that time of the annual flight cycle. And then there was higher alpha diversity in ephemeral habitat during low water. And we know that ephemeral habitat maybe are supposed to be a little bit harsher than the permanent habitat because they are a little bit smaller and 
they should be more uh, less uh, favorable environmental conditions. But we saw persistence of uh, high uh, alpha diversity in these habitats. And we, we think that this could be due to transient legacy effects due to time lags and species sorting. Because these species uh, have been experiencing these periodic cycles and drying of water for centuries, and they may have developed adaptive traits for coping with environmental stress. And when that happens, um, it may take time for the species uh, to, to respond to contemporary effects of species sorting. But of course, we know that the human habitats eventually dry out, and when that happens, uh, species have to either migrate out of this habitat or they will face extirpation. Um, we saw higher species turnover in ephemeral habitats during low water. Uh, and we thought that this could be due to uh, increased ecological drift because um, during low water, uh, there is more aggregation and the habitat becomes more unfavorable, and there is likely to be more increased random um, variation in the number of individual species, and that can increase heterogeneity within a habitat site. Um, and then we, as we, show, we, we saw a high, higher nestedness in permanent habitat. We saw higher nestedness in permanent habitat uh, and we thought that this could be due to uh, non-random dispersal because these permanent habitats remained connected throughout the duration of the study. Therefore, uh, species may have dispersed in a non-random manner from one habitat to another, resulting in one habitat being some sort of a subset of the other in terms of species composition. And then we saw a significant turnover across habitat types during low water. And we know that during low water, um, habitat fragmentation occurs and there's isolation of uh, habitat patches. And these habitat patches may experience uh, different uh, kinds of environmental stresses. And when that happens, that could create divergence in species composition among habitats. And um, uh, this could also be to, due to uh, increased species sorting where when there is just sufficient amount of dispersal, uh, there may be uh, increased change in species identities among habitats. And then we saw that turnover was not significant across habitat types during high water because of increased connectivity among habitats, which may reflect a, a strong mass effects in community assembly. In conclusion, we see that hydrology influences fish diversity patterns in intermittent rivers of the lower Okavango Delta. And this system um, faces some potential threats, uh, such as water obstruction for irrigation, hydropower generation, and climate change. And these threats uh, may lead to declines in fishery production, food security, and diminished social and recreative activities. And also, um, they may lead to a negative impact on the tourism industry and the socioeconomic economic security of the riparian communities because some, some communities depend on these, uh, uh, these river systems for, for, for livelihoods. Therefore, the, the, the general management uh, intervention that may help to to conserve the aquatic ecosystem and function would be to maintain relatively natural flow regime. Um, I, I would like to thank my, my committee, my current land members, and uh, the fisheries, wildlife and fisheries department, and my advisor, the Okavango Research Institute, and my primary sponsor, the Botswana International University of Science and Technology. Uh, with that, I conclude my talk. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Iti. That was great. Um, okay, at this point, we uh, you can ask questions uh, again in the chat or 
by unmuting yourself and, and asking directly. Well, heck, I have a question. This is Kirk Weinmiller. Uh, how you doing, TT? I'm good. I'm good, Kirk. All right. So I wonder, what do you think would happen if flow actually increased and the uh, the system became less ephemeral? What do you think that would do to uh, diversity, both alpha and beta? I mean, it should increase productivity, but what do you think it would do to diversity? Um, if it becomes more perennial, um, oh, yeah, more perennial, right? Yes, what would yes. uh, I think mm, beta diversity would would decrease, but um, um, the the general ecosystem functioning would probably increase, and ecosystem services would be enjoyed more. But diversity in terms of alpha would likely increase, but beta diversity would decrease. That's what I think. Okay, thanks. Does that make sense? Cool, thank you. Um, that's great. Does anybody else have any questions for TT? I don't see any in the chat either. Um, well, if there are no more questions, uh, I guess we'll go ahead and, and wrap up the session. Again, Titi, thank you. And thanks to all the other uh, graduate student presenters. I think that was a, that was a really cool session. Um, so that's it for, for sessions for EIS, but uh, be sure to come back at 4.30. The link for the Zoom session is on our website. Uh, we'll be doing our closing remarks and award ceremonies. So. Uh, each session will have a uh, an award for best speaker, um, so it should be it should be a lot of fun. Okay, all right. Well, thanks everyone for showing up uh, and making this possible. Uh, it's obviously not possible without anyone showing up. So uh, we appreciate your support of graduate student research and your support yesterday for our, our plenary speakers. We we really appreciate it. Um, all right. Well, thank you. <laughs>